Hi everyone, this is a lecture on the final stage of cellular respiration, stage three, and then we're going to go over something called fermentation, which is a backup method of making energy in the absence of oxygen. So a reminder, when it comes to the energy that we get from cellular respiration, the key here in terms of the energy that we get, it mainly it lies in the final stage, which is going to convert all the setup that we did in the first two stages into ATP. And for multicellular organisms like humans, we really rely on this process because our bodies use so much energy. So this process is all about the electron carriers that we built in the first two stages. The NADH that we got from glycolysis, the NADH and FADH we got from the Krebs cycle, as well as the NADH that we got from the earlier step between the Krebs cycle and glycolysis of acetyl-CoA formation as well, also known as pyruvate oxidation. And in specific numbers, from one glucose you get 2 NADH from um, in acetyl-CoA formation, 2 NADH from glycolysis, and 8 NADH and 2 FADH from the Krebs cycle from one glucose. But in terms of final, for example, you wouldn't need to memorize the numbers, but just know that you get a lot of NADH in all of those substeps, and in FADH comes in only during the Krebs cycle. So this is the overview of respiration. I introduced this image and the diagram and this nice summary up in the last lecture, but just a kind of couple reminders. The final stages only occur in the presence of oxygen, while stage 2A and 2B don't directly use oxygen. They actually rely on the outcome of stage three because stage three's job is to not just use oxygen to help release and get a lot of ATP, but it's also going to get the energy from the NADH and FADH, which is gonna produce the empty batteries of NAD plus and FAD. And those empty batteries are what's required by stage two since they use so much of those empty batteries without the production of the empty batteries through oxidative phosphorylation, that last step, stage two won't happen. And stage three, of course, needs oxygen because oxygen is actually a key reactant in that stage. And this stage is known as oxidative phosphorylation. Sometimes people call it ETC, oxidative phosphorylation, to stand for the fact there's an electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation occurring. Oxidative phosphorylation is a specific term for the creation of ATP in this final stage. It's the setup of the electron transport chain to make ATP using ATP synthase and oxygen, okay? Now, um, this whole process is gonna take all the energy from our electron carriers and convert it to all that extra ATP that we may want, all right? Generally, it averages 32 to 34 ATP, so most cells average around 36 to 38 ATP, though it could be a little bit less than that, a little bit more. But in terms of memorizing for our class, 36, 38 is around the right ballpark for overall ATP created. And because there's four ATP made in the earlier stages, that means you earn about 32 to 34 in this last final stage. And because this process relies on oxygen, it's also known as aerobic respiration for aerobic cellular respiration. Now this process mainly occurs in the mitochondrial membrane. Um, the inner membrane of the mitochondria, and it's um, and it relies on all the proteins embedded inside that membrane. In your textbook, they refer to this last stage as electron transfer phosphorylation, but more commonly outside of our textbook, in other textbooks and most of the world, we call it oxidative phosphorylation. So just a reminder of the anatomy of mitochondria. What's mainly gonna happen is for this step, it actually relies on the inner membrane and in fact, it actually relies on the inner membrane and the pumping of the hydrogens build up in the intermembrane space. So this intermembrane is gonna get a lot of hydrogen pumped into it. So it's gonna help build that gradient. So in this case, you wanna think of, if we're gonna compare it to LDR, the inner membrane is the, inner membrane is the thylakoid membrane and we're using and we're using the intermembrane space, not unlike the way we use the inner thylakoid space in LDR 
to build up in hydrogen plus or H plus or also known as proton concentration gradient that can then be used for ATP synthase. And if you want a nice picture of it, I actually really like the picture that's from Khan Academy here. I think this is a really pretty picture. So just a heads up. Okay, so what's ultimately happening in the oxidative phosphorylation step, stage three, is we're gonna build a hydrogen gradient. But this time, instead of using light as our source of energy, we're gonna actually directly use our batteries we created, NADH and FADH. And we're gonna strip out the high energy electrons from them, and we're gonna use those electrons and pass them through an electron transport chain that's gonna help facilitate the pumping of hydrogen into the in intermembrane space. When that hydrogen gradient builds up, it's gonna eventually create this huge gradient that's gonna allow it to spin through ATP synthase just like it kind of would in any other situation. And then that will help force the creation of lots of ATP. Now this is considered an aerobic process because the bait that's gonna attract the electron through the electron transport chain is oxygen. Okay, so oxygen is gonna help create kind of like a magnetic force that's going to help encourage the electrons to in FADH and NADH to release and bounce through the electron transport chain. And ultimately, it, that electron will combine with oxygen and some hydrogen protons and then turn into water. So I'm kind of a huge fan of simplified diagrams when it comes to drawing out uh, photosynthesis and respiration. So I'm going to just draw a very simple picture. Okay, so this is kind of a simplified diagram. We have our electron transport chain here inside the inner membrane. We also have ATP synthase inside the inner membrane as well. The matrix on one side, in this area, we're actually, we're, Krebs cycle is happening and all that stuff. So slowly we're building up quite a bit of NADH and FADH, okay? I kind of like to think of these as my charged up battery. This is my crappy picture of a charged battery. Now, what's gonna happen is the electron in these guys is gonna actually get ripped out from the NADH and FADH, and it's gonna bounce through the electron transport chain. So we have our electron, and then that's bouncing through the electron transport chain. As it's bouncing through, it's actually encouraged to bounce through all three proteins in the electron transport chain, and escape the NADH and FADH because of the lovely delicious bait of oxygen at the end. This oxygen will combine with hydrogen and hydrogen ions and that electron plus the oxygen and hydrogen ions will all combine and then help form water that's going to be released. Um, the actual amount that's used is there's two, if you want to be real precise with the numbers, there's two hydrogen used and in terms of oxygen you only need one oxygen atom so there's half but that's not super important it's more important that you just know hydrogen and the oxygen gas when it receives the electron gets to turn into water now during this process as the electron is coming in it's actually encouraging the pumping of hydrogen into the intermembrane space so hydrogen is coming in from the matrix and it is slowly filling up our intermembrane space between my inner membrane and my outer membrane and it's being trapped in here and as a follow-up that NADH and FADH when they're the electron leaves it and the energy is being ripped out of it and being used to help transport hydrogen into the intermembrane space it's going to be converted to its empty battery form NAD plus and FAD plus, or not FAD plus, it's just FAD. And these are our empty battery versions. They are not charged, not much energy in them. And then because they're, but they're in the matrix where the Krebs cycle happens. So these dudes can go on and move on and become part of the, and enter into the Krebs cycle to be charged. And that is actually why stage two needs oxygen because without NAD plus and FAD to charge up, stage two can't happen because there's it lacks the reactants to charge. Now, when the hydrogen comes, it builds up, it now has this electrochemical gradient, just like what happened in LDR, but different this time because instead of using light, we use the energy batteries. And now the hydrogen is gonna force its way through 
ATP and shoot out. And in this process of shooting through ATP, it is then ATP synthase, it's going to create ATP from ADP. Okay. So I just drew that a little bit better. The hydrogen shoots through, goes through the ATP synthase, leaves out of it, and as it does it, it spins it and it helps create ATP from ADP plus one phosphate ion. And that's the basic gist of the entire oxidative stage. So it's really similar to LDR, but instead of using NADPH to dump our electron in, we're using oxygen as our final resting place for the electron. And instead of getting our energy from light, we're getting our energy from our electron carriers, NADH and FADH. And of course, using the mitochondria. And this is a slightly nicer image of the whole process, but it's basically what I just showed you. And again, oxygen is the bait that helps encourage the electron to move through the electron transport chain and receive the electron. And when it does, it converts to water, grabbing random hydrogens around it and combining into water. The electron transport chain of stage three and the oxidative phosphorylation part of stage three has happened, and that's the whole summation. So oxygen is ultimately the final acceptor of the electron. So if we're following all our terms for oxidation and reduction here, NADH and FADH are oxidized into NAD plus and FAD. Notice it's losing molecules, it's losing hydrogen, or not molecules, it's losing atoms. It's losing hydrogen, it is a smaller molecule, so it is lost. Oil rig, oxidation is lost, reduction is gain. So we are oxidizing it, and that's why it's called oxidative phosphorylation. And if we're following it also, if you wanted to know, this is being oxidized and um, water is being uh, is oxygen is being reduced into water because it became a bigger molecule as a result of this process. And the energy itself, though, was transferred to ATP. But So these two things are gaining amounts, so they're gaining energy, while the NADH and FADH are losing energy. Okay, and just a reminder of some terms that came up. So this is chemiosmosis, just like in LDR. It is building a hydrogen gradient to help facilitate the movement and flow of hydrogen from one side to the other side. Charge diffusion of ions across the membrane through a protein. You create a really strong gradient on one side, it's gonna create a lot of chemical potential energy, a lot of need and desire to get away from each other and move to the opposite side. Because not only is there a high concentration, there's also a bunch of positive charges built up on one side and they don't wanna be by each other. Positive doesn't like positive, so they wanna get away. And that force then allows it to move through ATP very quickly and very strongly, and that's going to help create the ATP. And in this case, right, LDR and oxidative phosphorylation, or stage three of cellular respiration, both do the same thing, except for photosynthesis, like I mentioned, it's energy from the sun, and for oxidative phosphorylation, that gradient is built from energy from electron carriers. The process of making ATP from um, that gradient, remember, substrate phosphorylation is making ATP the crappy way. You only get two ATP when it occurs in glycolysis and Krebs cycle because you're getting ATP from just simple enzyme reactions. But this reaction of creating a gradient of hydrogens to use ATP synthase, it's a really intense step. So it also has its own special name. So chemiosmosis refers to the hydrogen gradient and electron transfer phosphorylation refers to the specific use of a hydrogen gradient to make ATP. So that's why some people call stage three electron transfer phosphorylation, like your textbook, though oxidative phosphorylation is a more common term. And this is just a fancy uh, summation of what I stated earlier in the picture. So if you want like kind of a nice step-by-step -step diagram, this is a nice one. Though I do encourage you to draw it out because I think that's very helpful to memorizing and practice drawing it out without looking at your notes or anything. So in this stage, this is where most of our energy is made. Now you may not actually realize, but our, the energy that has created ATP, we're actually only capturing some of the energy that was stored in the glucose molecule because a decent chunk of it is still lost through heat. But at least we got a decent amount of ATP from it. And if you actually connect the dots, if you recall from um, photosynthesis, in that instance there, to make one glucose, you needed 18 ATP and I believe 12 NADPH, 
So you use 18 ATP to make the um, sugar. But in this case here, we take that sugar and we bust it into up to 38 ATP. So you got double the ATP you had to use to make the sugar in photosynthesis in the first place. So even though it's not a perfect process and you do lose a lot of that energy to, into heat, you still got more ATP by taking the sugar and converting it to ATP instead of just getting ATP only from um, photosynthesis because they, right, 18 ATP needed for photosynthesis, but you're getting now 38 ATP from that sugar. So this is kind of a summation of how oxidative phosphorylation is different than LDR. So they are similar in that they're about making ATP, but they have slight differences in their source of energy and what receives the electrons in the end as well as where they're located, of course, because mitochondria versus chloroplasts, that's kind of a big deal. But other than that, very similar process, but you really need to know the differences between the two to prevent yourself from mixing them up on the exam. Because when you're learning photosynthesis and respiration side by side, it's incredibly easy to mess them up and to reshuffle all the information in your head. So be very careful when you're learning this stuff to make sure you also study it and differentiate and practice drawing it out without looking at your notes for both the oxidative phosphorylation versus LDR. I would also do the same thing when it comes to the Krebs cycle and Calvin cycle and you should draw out and practice drawing out the Calvin cycle without looking at your notes as well as the Krebs cycle because again they're so similar in terms of like movement and stuff you're going to mix it up if you do not practice it. So I really encourage that you practice drawing things out without looking at your notes to prevent making those mistakes. Okay, so these are the overall energy yields. Um, on our final, I'm not gonna ask you to memorize the numbers, but if I did ask you to memorize the numbers, these are the specific numbers that are made when you break down one glucose at each stage of the respiration. Um, but the key thing here, and the reason why I brought it up is you're gonna notice NADH is involved in all these steps whether it's about becoming products or becoming reactants or being used as a reactant. And also electron carrier, FADH as well. But in this case, the electron carriers are really important for these substages of, glyco of um, respiration, even though you don't see it in the main respiration equation that is shown, let's see, over here. But they're really important. So, and what also means if those are really important, their other version, the empty battery version is just as important. And you notice here where I said, you need oxygen in order to do stage two, even though you don't use oxygen directly in stage two, it's really ultimately because of those empty batteries that you need to do, you need oxygen to do this stage. And I just realized I made a mistake in the earlier picture. Um, just a heads up if you were if you wrote this stuff on the at the very beginning of your notes um, I didn't realize that I made a mistake on this diagram but um, this isn't just Krebs cycle this is this 8 and 2 FA, FADH is actually a result of the Krebs cycle and acetyl CoA formation okay but anyways back to this stuff the so in order to start respiration and get to the first two stages you actually need those empty batteries NAD plus and FAD. Without those two batteries, you cannot do respiration. So what happens if you don't have oxygen? Well, unfortunately, if you don't have oxygen, you run out of your main source of NAD plus and FAD. So there's no way, especially for you to do the stage two stuff because it uses so much NAD plus and FAD. However, we do have a form of regenerating just a teeny bit of NAD plus, but it is dangerous. And that form of NAD plus is called fermentation. So we'll get into it. So if no oxygen is available, basically the whole electron transport chain process backs up. Because you have no oxygen to receive our electron, you don't pull the electrons out of NADH and FADH and they just build up and then there's no way to do stage one and stage two. And also because you're not pulling energy out of them, you can't finish out stage three and you don't make energy. And basically your cell runs out of energy and dies. One of the most effective poisons in the world, cyanide, 
actually poisons people by basically destroying the electron transport chain so it can't function and it prevents the electrons from being pulled out and that's why people die almost instantly from cyanide poisoning because they just full-on run out of energy and can't use the oxygen that they have in their bodies. So if you don't have oxygen, you cannot continue all the crazy steps. However, there is a backup way to regenerate NAD+, but you can't regenerate a ton of it, and it's called fermentation, like I mentioned earlier, and it allows you to regenerate a little bit of NAD+, in the absence of oxygen. So you're gonna hear the word, and I mentioned it earlier, aerobic and anaerobic. So aerobic is um, in the presence of oxygen, and anaerobic means that there, no oxygen is present or needed. Okay, so if you've heard of aerobic exercise, when you do it, you kind of run out of breath, and that's because you're burning through so much oxygen, you're, you feel that process is in your body trying to encourage you to get more oxygen. And anaerobic exercise, like lifting weights, doesn't make you go out of breath because it's not burning oxygen as quickly. So that's, that's, that's where you might have heard the terms aerobic versus anaerobic. But in terms of biology, it actually means using or needing oxygen or no oxygen is there or it doesn't need oxygen. Okay? So the entire cellular respiration process with stage one, two, and three is aerobic. However, the first step is actually anaerobic. Um, and in the absence of oxygen, you don't do stage two and stage three. So the overall process of cellular respiration is aerobic, but without oxygen, you actually get energy from glycolysis, and then you use your backup method of fermentation to remake the NAD+. So fermentation itself doesn't necessarily get you the energy. Glycolysis gets you the energy. But then you can take the products of glycolysis and turn it into something else, maybe lactate, maybe ethanol, which is alcohol. And then in that process of converting pyruvate into other stuff, since you can't move it to the mitochondria because there's no oxygen available for it to be used, you can regenerate your NAD+. And that NAD+, can then be recycled to make more glycolysis happen from glucose and you can get a little bit of energy from it. But there is some problems. One, you're not making nearly as much ATP as you need. So if you're a large organism, it's very dangerous. You can get away with fermentation very briefly, but in the long run, it can be damaging. And the second thing is a lot of these products, ethanol and lactate, they're actually toxic in large amounts to cells. And the unintentional, we call it byproducts. I think I highlighted it over here byproducts. So they're not the main product. The main product of fermentation is NAD+, but the side products of ethanol and lactate, they are kind of dangerous. So if there's a buildup of ethanol and CO2 around bacteria, fungi, and plants, one kind of fungi, yeast specifically, over time they'll eventually die. Now humans have been very creative and we have actually found ways to harness these things to make uh, bread Bread actually creates CO2 to help create lift, and there is a little alcohol in bread dough, but it burns off in the baking process, and to make alcohol, obviously. And there's also fermentation uh, that we have harvested from certain bacteria and fungi groups, and they create lactic acid, and lactic acid makes things sour and curdle. So we actually take advantage of that, and we have used it to curdle milk. So we use bacteria cultures to make uh, cheeses and yogurts and stuff like that. And if we allow that fermentation process to happen, eventually those microbes that are, are used would actually die out. So that's so fermentation can be dangerous in the long run because it can be helpful, but ultimately it's not preferred because in large amounts without ability to get rid of that waste, it can be dangerous to the organism. For us humans, we actually feel that burn. When you work out really hard, you sometimes get this lactic acid burn in your muscles, and that's to tell you, hey, I don't like this. Please slow down so we can make, we can get enough oxygen in our bodies to make oxygen the healthy way that doesn't hurt, that doesn't make lactic acid as a result. But these fermentation side processes are really all about regenerating that NAD plus if we don't have oxygen. So at least we can get some energy out of our glucose, even though it's not nearly as good as the energy we would get from 
cellular respiration with oxygen because then we can take that glycolysis and then move the products through stage two and stage three. All right, so that's the basic summary of our notes. Here are some takeaways. I don't feel like reading it. You can read it through it yourself. And these are your vocabulary words that we introduced. I went over a lot of information, but this is actually ultimately all the vocab that is brand new to you. And chemiosmosis, you might know, but I just wrote it down just in case you forgot. All right, that concludes our lecture for respiration. Make sure you study it. Make sure you compare it to photosynthesis and you practice both so you don't make a mistake. I do recommend you use Khan Academy. You probably should watch the crash course video because I think their diagrams are helpful. But I actually do encourage you to draw out the processes without your notes just to make sure you got it down. Because if you can draw these processes and summarize them the way I summarized them in my last two lectures in the simplified diagrams, these are a little bit more complicated. But if you can draw them out, you're going to know your material and you'll have it down. All right. Talk to you guys later. Bye.